Well, good morning. There's always a range of uh, feelings that people have when it comes to when you play Christmas music, how much you play Christmas music, and what Christmas music you play. In fact, some of you are here and you're just rabid, rabid Christmas music people. You want to go ahead and raise your hand, get that out there. You want to... You're usually the people who like to let everyone else know, right? For the rest of us, we just kind of kind of take it as it comes and goes and it increases as the closer we get to Christmas. I always find it interesting about the most uh, popular Christmas songs of all time. So this week, I looked up uh, what many people would say are the most famous Christmas songs of all time, and this will be one of the most controversial things I'll probably say uh, in the sermon today. Some of you guys won't walk away with anything from Luke 1, but you'll definitely remember what I had to say about the most popular Christmas song. So just up in, up in advance, like this is not my list. This is not what I would say are the most popular or the best. But these are what some people would say as they look at ratings and plays and radio and all that, uh, what, the t- what the most popular ones are. So here's a list. I know some of you will really, really say yes and amen to some of these. Number 10, Santa Claus is coming to town, right? Yeah. Nothing says Christmas like Bruce Springsteen. Well, if you uh, weren't impressed by that, number nine is called Pretty Paper by Willie Nelson. So I guess we're just getting ready for the Santa Claus look and everything, right? Number eight, Sleigh Ride by the Ronettes. Anybody on your list? You're lying. All right. Number seven, There's No Place Like Home for Us by the Holidays by the Carpenters. Okay. Some of you still have no idea what we're talking about. Number six, Little Drummer Boy by Bean Crosby. That probably makes a lot of people's lists. It's a pretty, pretty well-known one. Number five, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Michael Buble, especially. Any of you? Yep, that, there you go. Number four, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Harry Connick Jr., that's up on the list. Number three, I saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus, especially by the Jackson 5, evidently. Number two, Last Christmas by the infamous Wham. And uh, number one, All I Want for Christmas by Mariah Carey. Anybody, anybody, at least one of those? Anybody, how many of you guys are mad about the list now? Mad about the list, right? <clears throat> well, no matter what Christmas songs you have on your list, uh, no matter what stories they may tell, uh, true or not true, about Christmas, uh, the reality is uh, Christmas and songs have a way of opening our hearts, right, to the, the season that we're in, opening our heart to either the things that we hope for or wish for or pray for, And then also the realities of even listening to Christmas music and reminding ourselves of really the truth of the season and what Christmas is all about. When we think about the Christmas story, and in a moment we're going to be in Luke chapter 1, when we think about all the things that surround the story of the gospel and the good news, the greatest news of all, when we think about all the people that are in the Christmas story and in the gospels, when we think about the timing of of the circumstances and situations that would impact the original first song of Christmas. If we think about uh, Julius Caesar and his rule and reign, and then, and then the most important person eventually in leadership in, during this time, <clears throat> Caesar Augustus, and how Augustus was de- declaring himself divine, and how he had given himself the title, the Son of God, and how in his divinity and, and declaring that he was the, the kind of quote, son of God, that he would seize more and more power and he would try to end certain civil wars. And we think about how he's trying to bring peace and Rome flexing and expanding his power and how you tell everybody that when he enters their time, their season, that he was going to bring the good news. This is where we actually get the original words, good news and gospel. And when Augustus would start to rule and reign, people would call him savior, son of God, bringer of peace, and the person who brings the good news. Right in that, in all those surroundings, all the circumstances of the songs of the world, during Luke chapter 1, we have the ultimate song of the story of Christ. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 56. If you have your Bibles or a Bible app open to Luke 1, verse 26 through 56, we say, I got it. Let's just read that, and then we'll, toward, uh, actually, we'll come back and re- probably read this again on Uh, the Christmas Eve services, but let's start in verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, 
you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will rule and reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. And if you want to write in your Bibles or in your margins, I'd love for you to underline these next two verses. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord shall come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He's performed mighty deeds with his arm. He's scattered those who are proud and are inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. And Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. That's the word of the Lord, amen? So when we hear these Christmas stories, when we see this song of the, of the original first Christmas, if you will, we have so many things to look at and remind ourselves about the story of Christmas. We have so much uh, things to study and to learn and to be encouraged by and challenged by from the original first gospel good news story. When we see that the angel Gabriel told Mary she was going to have a child, this was not welcome news. This is not the song that she at first wanted to hear of her life. She was engaged to Joseph, but not married. She'd be an unwed, pregnant teenage girl. I mean, how would that happen? How would this turn out? Would Joseph reject Mary? She could be even subject to death. This was not supposed to happen. This was not in her plan. If she was writing a a song for her life, this is probably not what she first originally intended or estimated. And now she's going to be known to be pregnant before marriage? Think about that. Think about the rumors that she would face. This is a real person in a real time with real issues and real challenges. She could be the subject of rumors. She could be the subject of gossip. She could be in danger if her, son, if her child really is the Messiah. She could be in danger not with just other people and family, but she could actually be in danger from kings. And there she was, this ordinary teenage girl. And her life being turned upside down. An ordinary person like Mary to be used by God in such a favorable, incredible way. Mary, in so many ways, just average person from an average town, in an average situation, loving her engaged, uh, uh, what we would consider fiance, what they would, they would consider betrothed, someone who is committed to another person to eventually be in marriage. What an amazing moment and story. 
But let's not get Mary's story confused. She is a virgin. And this part of the scripture is incredibly important for us. It's not that Mary somehow was favorable because somehow she had done something to be this special person. But instead, she had the favor of God on her, not because of what she's done, but because the story that God wants to tell. And the story that God wants to tell is that he's going to use an ordinary person, an ordinary teenage girl like Mary, who was simply just living an ordinary life, and God poured out his favor on her in such a way that he invites her in to this ultimate Christmas song, this ultimate Christmas story. You see, Mary's story is like a lot of our stories, that God in his graciousness, that God in his mercy would actually use our lives for anything. This is why 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 28 and 29 says this, God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring nothing what the world considers important so that no one can even boast in the presence of God. This is the story of Christmas, right? And then this original Christmas song, these original Christmas stories. This is what God is doing in Mary's life. He's taking her, there she is. She's willing, she's, she's humble, she's available, and God's going to use her to retell this story over and over again in the lives of so many of us. Anyone who turns by the grace and mercy of God, turns to faith in God and say, listen, I'll use your story. No matter what your past is, no matter what your present is, I'll use it for your good and God's glory. Imagine what it must have felt like in these days to be Mary. Imagine what it must have felt like to be what? She she was wondered when she heard this message that God was going to use her. Now, actually, in a lot of our text or translations, the word wonder in the English doesn't actually all, all the time give us the best understanding of Mary's response to this situation. The Greek word wonder in its original means to make an audit. It's an accounting word. Now, how many guys, when you hear accounting, you get really excited? How many of you just thinking about being audited? Sounds like great news. No, right? And here, Mary, she uses an accounting word. <clears throat> she uses an auditing word. She uses uh, something that means to add things up, to weigh them, to ponder them. And when she weighs them and ponders them, She's trying to be intensely rational about this irrational story, right? And she is troubled. Some of you know what that means when you start to think about counting the days till Christmas and all the things you have to do before Christmas, right? You start to, it starts to trouble you. It starts to concern you. Well, multiply that by how many more when you're a little teenage girl in a small little town that everyone's overlooked and you're a virgin and you're engaged to be married to another man, and suddenly you get the news that you are going to be the mother of a child given to you by the almighty, holy God. This is not something that Mary thought, well, of course I'm the one. There's massive barriers to her believing and thinking and and not doubting. And she is, in the original language, you you can feel the expression of her doubt, of her questioning, of her reasoning. Like, this would have to be a miracle. Like, how is this even possible? Like, like, Lord, you you know my story. I've just simply been obedient to what, how you want me to be and how you want me to live. Like, this is wild, right? This is sometimes the same questions or doubt that we have when we actually, in our own hearts, we're honest about the Christmas story. Like, we wrestle with the text. We wrestle about the story. Sometimes we just kind of go along life and we just believe it because, well, the previous generation believed it or our friends believed it or our coworkers believed it or our culture, maybe where we live or our neighborhood believes it. But the reality is there are other people in this world, friends, that are really wrestling with, is this really the good news that will change my life? Is this really the miracle I should believe in? Can I really stake my life and my eternity on this truth of this story? You see, the truth is, No matter what you believe, you're going to have to believe in something miraculous. You just are. Like you're, it's not going to feel natural. 
It's going to, you're going to have to believe in, in even understanding this life and eternity. At one point, you're going to have to lean all your faith into something. Is this not true? In fact, listen to Australian author and speaker Glenn Shrivener when he, said, he puts it like this. Christians believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. Atheists believe in the virgin birth of the universe. You have to choose your miracle. Which one is it? Is it that none of this story really matters? And when you look at the galaxies and the world and all its creation, it's just suddenly there. And it came from nowhere. And it came out of nothing. And it's not created by anyone. Well, that's your story. If you're going to believe that, that's a virgin birth of the universe. Or at Christmas, you start to say, no, like Mary's song is my life song. And I believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And I may sometimes doubt and I may sometimes wrestle and sometimes I may question and sometimes I might have to audit in accounting words and try to really think about what I believe and why I believe it. But when we doubt, it doesn't mean we believe. It doesn't mean we're closing our our heart. Actually, sometimes it means that we're even more opening our hearts and minds to what is really true. This is a story of Mary, and this is what she does. She asks the question, verse 34, how will this be? Like, how's it going to be? If only for you, God, can this actually be? In the original language, like, this seems to be totally impossible. And yet, what does angel, the angel Gabriel say to her? Look at verse 37. For no word from God will ever fail. Maybe that's what you need as you head toward Christmas this year. Maybe just this first part of what I would say is a great uh, line in the Christmas song, in a Christmas story. Maybe that's what you need today. For no word from God will ever fail. Failed. Do you believe this? Do you need to be encouraged by this promise? I mean, Mary's life song and following God will be at first a road of doubt, but obedience will continue to happen. Again, it's not that she's being disobedient at all. She's wondering, she's questioning, she's asking, and it will lead to her saying to the Lord eventually, like she will have an incredible response immediately for no word from God will ever fail. She'll start to think about this. She'll start to think about the, the God's incredible plan to use an ordinary person like her. It's really incredible to think about this. Jonathan Fing, he's a professor of physics and astronomy at the University of California of Irvine. He writes about the possibilities and the challenge of believing. He says, if the distance between the earth and the sun is 93 million miles, imagine it being a thickness of a sheet of paper. So then the distance from the earth to the nearest star would be a stack of papers 70 feet high. In same comparison, the diameter of the Milky Way would be a stack of paper over 300 million, or excuse me, 300 miles high. So you're tracking a thickness of a sheet of paper, earth to sun. This is from the earth to the nearest star would be 70 feet high. The diameter of the Milky Way would be a stack of paper 300 miles high. And compare all that to the reality that in the Christian faith, we actually believe that the God who made all the stars and all the galaxies cares enough about us to be born as a human and to suffer and to die and to bring forgiveness and new life to ordinary, sin-filled, broken people. That is the reality that the word of God will never fail in the Christmas story. In fact, the Bible actually says in Hebrews chapter 1 that Christ actually holds all of this together with just one word of his power. Now, thinking about all that, is that the kind of person you ask to be in your life to be your assistant? Is that the type of response that we should have to the Christmas story and asking maybe Christ just to kind of be a consultant? Or is this the response in which we say, Lord, Father, Leader, Savior, King, I believe that no word from you will ever fail. 
I am the Lord's servant. That's what Mary said, right? Verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. She ponders it. She audits it. She looks at it. She looks at what the world is seeing about the fact that there are other leaders who are going to have the good news and they're going to bring peace and they're going to be in charge. And yet she knows there's something bigger going on. There's There's a better story. There's a better song to be sang. And she wants to obey the living God. She wants to obey the Lord amidst all the crazy possibilities and all the, all the impossibilities and all the natural meeting the supernatural. <clears throat> and yet she has complete surrender. Here she is in a teenage girl, bottom of the social ladder during her culture, during her day. And she says, even wondering how God will do this, she says to God, God, I am your servant. How is that? Like, how is it that Mary, <clears throat> when hearing this story and seeing God's favor on her life, <clears throat> and, and then the reminder of the angel that, that no word of the God will ever fail, and then responding <clears throat> back that, that the Lord, that she'll be the Lord's servant, how is it that she's able to, to muster up the, the, the grace of God, the strength of God to have this type of response? How is it that she's, that she's even able <clears throat> to trust and believe that God would use her in this way? What I'd actually suggest to you that Mary has actually set her heart over many, many years to what the Jewish people would set their hearts to, the songs they would listen to all throughout their childhood. And those songs that they would actually hear and listen to over and over on repeat, not just during a certain season, but all throughout their years, would actually be the greatest songs ever written, which are what? They're actually from the Old Testament, the Psalms. In fact, the Jewish people would have a book of 150 psalms, and over time they would memorize not just a few, but most of them, and some people even all of them, as they entered their teenage years. Author, pastor, Dr. Robert Morgan, he actually goes through this song that Mary sings in Luke chapter 1, phrase by phrase, and he writes that he finds about 50 different verses in the psalms that Mary includes in her song that she sings back to this situation that we have in Luke chapter 1. In the response that the angel Gabriel says, no word from God will ever fail, and she says, okay, I'm the Lord's servant. And she says back to him, may your word to me be fulfilled. How is it she can say that? Well, Look at verses 46 through 49. She starts to remember what all the Psalms say about what the Lord has done for her. My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. She's mindful of what? She's mindful of all the ways that the Lord has been faithful to her. That's a great reminder, right? In fact, we transitioned from Thanksgiving to Christmas. The previous two weeks, we talked about all the ways that we can be thankful. Ryan did a great job reminding us with the post-it notes, right? Ways that we can be thankful. Mary here, she's doing the same very thing. She's being mindful. And when she's being mindful, she's rehearsing in her heart what she knows is true about God. She's thinking about Psalm 139, where it says, How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast to some of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the sand. If I, when I'm awake, I am always with you. She's thinking about what? She's thinking about all the ways the Lord has blessed her life. Even in her early teenage years. What great maturity, right? She's mindful of these things. I wonder how you and I could do the same during the Christmas season. To be mindful of all the Lord has done for us. And listen, if you come to a hard day, a difficult day, and sometimes we have these days where you can't even count or write down the ways the Lord has been mindful of you, go back to some of the greatest songs that have ever been written, the Psalms, and the Psalms will remind us, even in our darkest days, even if the holidays are really tough times for you, they'll remind you how the Lord has been faithful to you and how his word will never fail. 
And when you do that, when we do that, what, what happens? It changes the lyrics and the lines that we hear in our heart that the world wants us to hear. It starts to change it. And we start to, what, play and hear a different song, how the Lord has been faithful to me. And then Mary starts to say, what, no, has the Lord been faithful to me? But she looks at verses 50 through 55. She says, the Lord's been faithful to you. She starts to turn first to herself, and then she starts to turn to others. His mercy has been extended. He's been merciful to me. He's been merciful to you. His mercy extends, she says, from generation to generation. He has. You can look back at verses 50 through 55. You can even circle it. You can circle all the ways that she, how many times she says, he has, he has, he has. You can just go through there, just circle, but he has right there. You can highlight it if you're on an app. He has. And we know this. When we study the Bible, if the Lord says one thing, you can count on it. If he says, says it twice, he's trying to get your attention to it. If he says it three times, four times, and five times, especially back to back, there's actually a, a repeating verse that the Lord is playing to get our heart's attention. He has. Will the Lord be faithful? Mary says he has. Will he come through? Mary says, well, he has. Will he still love you? Mary says he will. What if, will he care for my friend like like he has for me? Well, he has. Will he provide a way of escape during difficult times? Well, he has. Will he be there for my children and my grandchildren and their children, future generations? Well, Mary says he has. So really, the journey that we have to Christmas is a great opportunity to say, Lord, Thank you for how merciful you have been to me and to others around me. Right? This is Mary's song. His mercy extends, especially to those, she says, who fear the Lord. He's performed mighty deeds with his arm. He's been flexing. Right? Man, the Lord, thank you for that. Thank you, 2021, how, 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 how you've been showing yourself strong. He's even scattered those who are proud. In other words, he knows people who are, he knows who's humbled themselves before him and he knows people who say, God, I know better than you. And he is keeping count. He does know. And he will search your heart. He's even brought down rulers from their thrones. All those who are so powerful, all those who are so haughty, all those who said, God, I can do better than you. I know better than you. I don't even need you. Be careful. Psalm 2 talks about that. It warns us. He's lifted up the humble. Man, he's filled the hungry with good things. He's he's even sent the rich away empty. And he's helped his servant. Blessed are those whose God is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord. Right? This is Mary's song. And her song can encourage your life song today. Ultimately, what's Mary foreshadowing? Mary is foreshadowing, ultimately, God the Son, being born of a virgin, taken upon flesh, being tempted in every way, yet without sin. And her song and her heart is going to impact the song of Christ on this earth. Because this is actually all the things that Christ did. Is it not? She looks back at the same time she's foretelling the future. Christ helped people. Christ sent the rich away empty. In fact, he, he actually got in a conversation with the rich man once. What, what is it, Lord? What is it, Master, that I must do to have eternal life? And he said to him, what? Well, give up everything you have and follow me. Because he knew that wealth had gripped the man's heart. And the man went away sad. But he filled, the Lord filled the hungry with good things. He lifted up the humble. He brought rulers down to size. He scattered those who were proud of heart. And he performed mighty deeds with his arm. He laid down his life. He died a sinner's death, though he was without sin. He shed his blood. In our place, despite our sin and shame, he was buried for three days. He rose again to show that he's the savior of the world to ultimately teach us that the song of Christmas is what? 
no word from God will ever fail. And may our response be, I will be your servant, Lord. And may your word to me and my life be fulfilled. I pray that's your response as well. Let's stand for prayer. Father, we thank you for Luke chapter 1. And we thank you for Mary's response despite the circumstances and her heart's desire to be a part of the good news of Christ. Thank you that your word has never failed even when we seem troubled or face difficulty or wonder what's next or we don't completely understand what we're going through. And Lord, may you, by your spirit, enable us to have a posture of Mary's heart, to say, Lord, we will serve you. We will obey you. We will do what you've called us to be and to go where you've called us to go. May your word to us today be fulfilled. May we be obedient no matter what you've called us to do and where you've called us to go. May the posture of our song, maybe the song of our heart be this very thing. We love you and we praise you in Christ's name.